from Las Vegas, it's theCUBE. Covering IBM Think 2018. Brought to you by IBM. We're back at IBM Think 2018. This is theCUBE, the leader in live tech coverage. My name is Dave Vellante and I'm here with my co-host, Peter Burris, day two of our wall-to-wall -wall coverage of IBM's inaugural Think Conference. Rajesh Nambiar is here. He's the general manager of global business services for application services within IBM. Thanks for coming on theCUBE. Thank you for having me here. So how's this event going for you? You're in from Singapore, we were saying, you must love the fact that IBM's consolidated a lot of its major events in one place. You get a lot done in a, in a week. Absolutely, I think this is four or five days that we're going to be here. Phenomenal amount of energy. I mean, when you go around, you see that. I think, as you said, you know, combining some of the events that's made it even more interesting for us. So we're meeting more people, more clients, more productive uh, sessions for sure. So let's talk about what you do with application services. And then we really want to get into one of the themes that, that Ginny hit on today, which is incumbent disruptors and competing from the core of your proprietary data. Um, so let's get into it. I start with your organization and what you guys do. Absolutely. So as I as you mentioned, and I, I do the application services for, uh, for GBS and, right. and within IBM. And within application services, I think we focus on application development and, and management, which is a large area for us. And as you know, that IBM has been managing applications for many, many large clients over the period of time. And you know, it's a very large portfolio for, for IBM. Indeed. Well. What we see um, truly is um, enterprises, as you saw, and uh, uh, you know, they are going to have uh, enormous uh, amount of issues with the, the new uh, new age companies, if you may, you know, like all of the, the the new companies which are sort of coming off. You can call them bond digital or bond in cloud or, or Uberization of the uh, organizations, whatever. So you you will find that enterprises are going to have significant issues, uh, you know, maintaining their competitive advantage over a period of time. And and, and one of the ways they could um, you know sort of regain that um, uh, leadership or competitive advantage would be by ensuring that they are digitally reinventing themselves. The problem is, uh, you know, and again Forbes have recently had an article around saying that uh, about 80% of the uh, digital transformation projects really fail, right? There are multiple reasons as to why they fail. And I want to argue saying that one of the, and you heard from Ginny this morning that you, know, you have the sort of the, uh, the business architecture and the technology architecture. So if you focus on the technology for a second, you will find that um, many of these new incumbents that you mentioned will, if they try to compete purely on the digital side of the equation, they will have a harder chance or they may, may not even get where they want to go. And we want to argue saying that, you know, if they kind of pay attention to the core they have, and I want to sort of define what the score in digital is going to be. So think of this this way. I mean, core is what, if any company has been around for a while, then they would have had uh, a significant amount of core systems, systems of records, if you want to call it where they have the business process uh, uh, embedded into that. They have the customer data embedded into that. Now, what's happening on the other side, of course, everybody wants to get there, the whole digital reinvention. On the digital side of the equation, you do have systems of engagement, right? Where you, know, you truly un understand and, and uh, engage, I want to say, customers, but then you can also have employees of your own organization. So you're going to engage them in the last mile, if you may. What it touches the customer, touches your employees, that's what we call systems of engagement in the digital. Now, organizations tend to see these two as two different things. Mm. Uh, and and they, you know, if you do not build your digital ecosystem, leveraging what you have in core, I, be, I believe that you know, the chances of you fa failing in your digital transformation is very, very high. Why is that? Because I, I believe the intersection of these two worlds, if you may, the core and the digital, is not that easy for people to leverage. And I be, believe that you know, we as a company, we help our clients sort of leverage that intersection, if you may. Yeah. Okay, so where do you start? Is it application modernization? Is it allowing them to develop applications that are more sort of more native, as you say? Uh, where, where do you, when you talk to customers, where do you see the starting point? Okay, so when you look at these two, fundamentally, um, there are synergies between these two worlds, and there are discordance. Mm -hmm. Synergies are natural, why? Because, as I mentioned before, in the core or the systems of records, you'll find um, business process getting embedded, customer's data getting embedded, and then in the, on the other side, in the digital system, you always have the, the user experience, which is what we all want to drive. I mean, the user experience is all about everything. I was talking to a bank recently, uh, based in Asia. So they said, we built this 
phenomenally uh, you know, wonderful, uh, user-friendly mobile app for our customers. And what happened was, uh, the app was fantastic, and it was great user experience, and everything was fine. It's just that for every transaction, it took like a minute for the balance to show up in the, on, the, on the mobile app. That's not what you want, because why is that? Because you're focusing on the digital only, the fact that it has to go to your core systems, get the customer data, then bring it back to the, uh, the watch app or, or the mobile app or whatever, that wasn't plumbed the right way. And hence, our point being that if you, if you look at the, uh, the synergies, which is great, there are lots of discordant because the way the old systems are being built is very different. Like we're using a waterfall. The new systems are yeah. getting built in a different way. If you, if you leverage the synergies, manage the discordant in a, little, in a, in a nicer way, so a great example would be, so do you have microservices out, coming out of your core systems to enable your digital systems? Do you have the right APIs getting built from the core systems to enable your, your digital systems? If you are able to manage this intersection well, then I think you have a play. And that's how I, I believe that we should. So again, to your point, do you do modernize? I believe you do three things uh, to get the, get the synergy right. Okay. One would be, um, you have to optimize your core systems for efficiency because more and more uh, the systems get older and older, you're going to have uh, uh, challenges in maintaining them, more expensive to maintain them, so you optimize those systems for efficiency. Then you modernize them to build in or to enable new capability. So second, as I said modernize, what do you really do? You're making sure that it is easier for the digital systems to get to you, to understand what you're doing, to get the customer data. So that was a modernized piece. The third is that you, you have to innovate uh, with, um, uh, with, the, with the sort of co-create, if you may, uh, and make sure that you're able to build those newer systems, digital systems, using the, using the core and enabling the core for growth. So if, you want, if you're an organization, if you want growth, you're not going to get it you know, if you don't do these three things, in my opinion. Yeah. So Josh, many years ago, uh, I did a, uh, a research project for a client, and we looked very closely at the consequences of increasing the functionality and automation in systems of engagement and how that drove work back in the core. And we found that every successive generation of enhancement on the systems of engagement drove the number of transactions back at the core sevenfold. Are you seeing relationships like that? Is there rules of thumbs that people should use now as those systems of engagement get even more powerful, more uh, human friendly? What, what, what is the new kind of expectation these days? So the, the ratio is roughly what you said, right? And for every, uh, you know, about seven or eight times is what you're going to drive the, uh, for every single transaction which is arising out of uh, systems of engagement. However, one of the way to make it more efficient in the system, uh, systems of uh, records, in the, in the, in the core systems if you may, is by usage of all of this modern uh, you know, uh, stuff that we're talking about. Whether it is, you know, if you have you're designed your core systems and enabled microservices in the right way, maybe instead of having seven or eight transactions, you could be able to do that in two or three, right? Similarly, the and APIs- And stage them. And stage them, yeah, in a, in a certain way, so that you're not getting into the performance issue, which I talked about in this banking example, as you know, you, know, you, can't, you don't want to build a, a wonderful digital app, uh, but uh, having that to go through a, a sig significant performance issue over the period of time. So, so that is one of the things. The other uh, important element of what you just now said is also the, the talent piece of it, right? Uh, we, we underestimate, I think, the, you know, we said one of the reasons uh, why many of these engagements fail is also because people don't think talent is a big deal in, in all of this. Because when you really see, if you're, if you're a, been a company, uh, been around for a while, you have a very strong core, and your people in the IT organization are going to be wired somewhat to the processes which are, which are going to be sort of of, of uh, the old age, if you may. And how do you move to this new world of digital? So there is a fundamental difference from the talent point of view. Uh, two things. You're, as an organization, you're moving from process-centric to user-centric. Now you want to build something for your customer, for your employee. When you do that, the talent base, of course there's a mindset change, but also, uh, a simple example. We always hired people for skills. Right? We still, some of the companies still do, for skills. But I believe that's a passe, right? Because you know, what you now need is a, a, a tenacity for learnability, or tenacity for a lifelong learning for the people whom you're hiring. Not necessarily a skill that you, you value today, because what happens in, 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 in today's world, after six months, that skill is no longer valuable for you. So what do you do with them, right? So, but if you have a tenacity for lifelong learning, the ability for you to pick up new skills and then transform yourself will be so high 
that you know we're not stuck with people who have old skills for a long period of time. I was talking to a senior, uh, a guy who runs development, and he said one of the biggest impacts of open source over the last few years was that it bought the notion of responsibility, recognition, uh, reputation, and changed the way that developers thought about collaborating with each other. Not just in the open source world, but overall. I think collaboration, and new collaboration, agile also has to be part of the equation. What do you think? Oh, without a question. In fact, I was about to say uh, that the, the collaboration is very, very key. Because again, you know, the, when you move from process-centric to user-centric, you also find you know, traditionally our organization is very role-based, right? So everybody had a role. I mean, I'm a developer, I'm a tester, I'm an architect. But in the new world, this is going to be changing into maybe pods of, of people who are sort of working on a garage method. I mean, everybody does everything. We have a smaller group of people who are able to deliver something very, very quick in an agile fashion, as opposed to the traditional way of saying, I'm sort of role-based, I have an organization, and that's how I operate. So I think there's significant difference. And again, I, I would probably say, uh, to leverage the talent for the newer market. You know, again, there are about two or three things that one could potentially do. One would clearly be this learnability. Skills are no longer uh, what is valued, it's learnability. The ability for you to sort of quickly move from one to the other would be valued. Second would be diversity of skills. Um, you know, today we hire more people with user experience, with psychology major. You would have never thought of this 10 years ago. We never hired anybody from art school. But we do that today. Right? I'm very happy. My son's a music major. My son is a psychology major. I was just telling you in the University of Colorado. So they get hired probably as well as probably the, the, the STEM students are going to be, right? So that's good. Right? And the last one is, of course, you know, I have this notion of called digital labor. I don't know if you've heard this term before. Uh, and, and Ginny talked about it today, right? So you're going to have man and machine when you do that. Automation is a great uh, influencer in all of this. And I think there are going to be uh, the digital labor and the human labor going to coexist. So we're calling it hybrid labor. So any task that we're going to do, we're going to have people, which is sort of higher order capability now, leveraging bots, which is the digital labor. So that's another important thing in the talent market. And the labor will increasingly require sort of multi-tool skills, not only domain expertise, but also digital skills. Absolutely. Or at least being able to understand how to leverage the, the machine intelligence. Absolutely. I want to ask you, and I know Peter, you got to go soon, but. Um, this trend with, with IoT, blockchain, we saw the IBM Maersk example today where, where they're attacking inefficiencies, where there's a third party trust involved, and it's creating a, a trustless system. Um, do you see a trend toward sort of putting token economics embedded inside of, of applications? Uh, things like blockchain um, increasingly going into core applications, is that a trend you're seeing yet? Yes, yes, I think, you know, not as much as we would like to see, but, mm -hmm. but I think it's, it's beginning to um, sort of develop over a period of time. I think blockchain is still, as I said, there is uh, uh, more in the experimentation phase and there are a few companies who have leveraged it fully. Great example is, as you saw this morning with, uh, with what we're doing with APMM, uh, Merck's, uh, you know, the, the fact that we're able to do the, the distribution systems, uh, you know, within shipping, uh, you know, and anywhere you're finding that there's going to be a significant amount of paperwork or um, transactional, um, you know, arrangements that are being done outside of the, uh, you know, the normal systems. I think blockchain would be a great uh, way to solve those issues. I want to tease your session a little bit. You got a, you got a talk. You got a CIO panel. When, when is that? Well, the talk is actually going to be, uh, I think, unlocking the the value of the core system. So it's right. going to be something similar to what we talked about. We've got great. Uh, session uh, with three CIOs who are going to be on the panel. We're going to have the Carhartt uh, CIO, John Hill is going to be on the panel, and they've done a lot of good work uh, in terms of truly making sure that they understood that if they don't leverage the core, they can't really get to the digital. Was that Carhartt? Carhartt, yeah. Oh, they, they, the they, only brand I wear? Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they'll be interesting. Then KLM, I mean, with their, I mean, uh, Air France actually uh, owns KLM now, so the Air France KLM, with, the, with their uh, history of the, the the core that I've had for several years, and how are they really moving into the, the new digital era, and then being a sort of a very, um, you know, uh, customer friendly airline, if you may. So he's going to talk about some of that. And then we also have the TPX, which is the communications uh, organization, which uh, they've, they've done, gone through about 12 acquisitions over the last uh, uh, 12 years, so one, one a year, pretty much. How are they integrating all of those companies, and how are they really putting them together into sort of one system. So that's and when is that session? The session is on Thursday morning at 11.30. I hope you guys are there to okay. watch that. I'm so worried because it's the last day. Well, it's a leave. getaway day, but listen, it's a good day to go down and check it out because 
you know, that notion of what incumbents should be doing and competing from the core is a very, very important idea. So, Rajesh, thanks for coming on theCUBE and explaining that. Best of luck to you uh, tomorrow, and you know, great to see you. Thank you so much. Thanks for having You're me. You're welcome. Here. All right, keep it right there, everybody. We'll be back with our next guest. This is theCUBE. You're watching live from IBM Think 2018. We'll be right back. <laughs>